This is Show Up as a Leader, a show from People Forward Network, helping you maximize your positive impact on the world by becoming your best, fully authentic self. Hey, everyone. It's Rosie. You are probably going to want to listen to this conversation that I had with Carolyn Cooley more than once. There are so many great things that she shares about her individual journey that I think you could take away for yourself from your own growth. And there's also such incredible things that she is doing at Bowery Farming, where she is the chief people officer. And if you're not familiar with Bowery Farming, she talks about it in the episode and just incredible mission they're doing, the game-changing work that they're doing. And Carolyn has such an incredible background of being with really large, well-established, well-known companies, then moving to the startup world and just such synergies of what does it mean to get out of your comfort zone. And so before I give you a couple highlights, if you have not yet subscribed, please make sure to subscribe. Head on over to Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Please make sure to rate and write a review for the episode. It makes a huge difference and we'd be super appreciative. So a couple things you're going to want to listen for in this conversation with Carolyn is a lot about what does it mean to normalize the discomfort of getting out of that comfort zone and why it is super essential to growth on an individual and a collective organizational level. We also have an incredible conversation about how when done well and done intentionally that your organizational values really do serve as your cultural anchors. And she gives great examples of how they are doing that. I think you can get a lot of really good nuggets of how you can put these into practice if you're just getting started with clarifying your values and purpose, or if you've been doing it for a while or refining or whatever that might be. And they also have such a unique approach to how they invest in learning and development for their people and really offering it with and for people rather than something done to them, including them in the process and really viewing it for them as a differentiator. So again, I just think you're going to get a ton out of this. Have a pen and paper handy. And here we go. Carolyn, I am geeky excited to have this conversation with you. I feel like we could probably talk for hours, (laughs) but we are just going to dive right into it. You have just this incredible background that for some people might seem, I don't know, backwards, but, you know, moving from large companies to smaller startups, and you just have this wealth of knowledge that has shaped who you are. Can you talk a little bit about that and specifically how your journey has shaped your approach to taking risks and really what it requires to have more human workplaces? I agree. I think sometimes when people see my background, they scratch their head a little or wonder how that all happened. I do like taking risks, always had from after college, going across the country and moving away from friends and family or the times that I've lived abroad or things like that. So I think risk taking has been a common theme personally and professionally. And there was a point at which I had worked at a couple of large organizations, such great experiences. I was talking about like foundational. When you join a big global company, typically they've been working for decades or possibly even a hundred years on refining like leadership programs and training and development. And so you learn from the programs and from the people such great foundational skills, but like sometimes you're missing that ability to go and create your own thing. And like for somebody who is such a risk taker, I think there was a point where it felt like I was playing it kind of safe, even when I was taking risks within these organizations. And I had this opportunity, now is about seven years ago, to go to a startup. And I had never thought of going to a startup before. It wasn't on my radar. If recruiters were contacting me, they were contacting me for big global companies because that was what was in my background. And when I had this opportunity to go to a startup, I was like, that's just wild. Like the company could fail. Like I was, when I was at, you know, Pepsi or Amazon or Honeywell, I was not thinking that those companies could fail. I was thinking I could fail or a project could fail, right? But, but not the company. And so there's so much safety in that. And so to have the opportunity to go to a small company, you're like, wow, we're not sure if this is going to work. And it's only going to work if we get all the right people together working to solve problems collectively and effectively. That's it. Like, that's the only way. You have to have like a great idea and then great people working towards it. It's like, I have to do that. I absolutely have to do that. The first time that I went and worked for a startup, we were living in Europe. 
And when I went to my husband, he's like, you got to be kidding me. We're going to leave Prague? Like, how do we leave living in Prague? But I just had to take the risk, had to do it. And it's so cool to have the opportunity to put your fingerprints on a company from the very start, to be part of building the culture, to be shaping the values, to be hiring early employees that will be part of developing the solutions that do allow for the company to become hopefully a generational company, a company that's around for decades or centuries as some companies are. I love that. And you know what I think is, as you were talking but there's pros and cons to everything. Some people are, oh, I like the safety and the structure of some of these big companies that have tried, true, proven processes. People who maybe don't like being in ambiguity, it's great, you know, and they have a lot of structure and great. And some people, you thrive in that environment and other people thrive with the nimbleness. So I think it's, you know, where your place is. But I think regardless of the size of the company, what's coming to mind as you're talking is in this disruptive world, that keeps throwing us one curveball after another, sometimes the tried and true and proven processes worked for a calmer, less disruptive world. They're not so much working now. And so much of what's happening today forces us to be more in that risk-taking, entrepreneurial, adaptable mindset that is unsettling for so many people. So how did you shape your approach to taking yes, your approach to saying yes, how has that shaped your journey? I think you're spot on because I still keep in contact with so many people that are at large organizations, big global companies, and we'll chat and they'll try to pick my brain for like, how do you take an, a more innovative approach in a big organization? Or how do you encourage people to take more risks, even in a company that might be set up not to fail, right? Be so large that like, how can it fail? But you're trying to get people to really push themselves outside of their comfort zones when I went for it, right? So I, I know like, uh, you know, how you do it that way, how you actually say yes, go into a, a small organization, know that actually at some point, it might fail. Like the company might no longer exist and you might not have a paycheck and you might have to live in that uncertainty and that, that type of ambiguity. But I do think that you can push yourself to experience that anywhere. So like I reflect on my time at large companies and I think about the types of assignments that I went for and the things that I did. And even very early on, in my the first company I worked for, which was Honeywell, I took on the role of leading diversity, equity, and inclusion, which back at the time was called just diversity. But the DEI space for Honeywell Aerospace globally, when I was two years out of school, had no special training in it, didn't know how to do it, definitely thought like, should I do this? Can I do this? Will I fail? But I thought the best way to learn is to try and I had mentors and some folks that were rooting for me. And it ended up being such an amazing experience. It has shaped so much of how I look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also how I look at risk-taking, right? Because I went for it. I botched some things. Everything wasn't perfect, but I survived, I thrived, and I learned from it. And so I think even looking for those experiences, even if you're in a large existing organization, push you outside of your comfort zone that you're not sure if you can be successful in, but making sure you have the right support system, right? People that are rooting for you, experts that you can trust and contact, all of those kinds of things. And I think that support system gave me the confidence to go for it. And maybe like just a little bit of me being a confident person in general, I was like, I could probably do it. But I think you can find those things that push you out of your comfort zone and to take a risk. I think that's so important because there's the old saying that growth doesn't happen inside our comfort zone. And for people who are research minded, you look at neuroscience research and actually getting uncomfortable is an essential component of growth. And so in the work we do, it's how do you normalize that discomfort? And one, you have to create a psychologically safe environment for people, like you said, where they have support system, they have mentor. This is a learning organization. And it's at the same time, we also have to support people in navigating that discomfort because for so many, it feels way too risky and they'd rather cling to what's familiar. Or I know I was coaching a team this week and working through some challenges they were having and they have someone who's like, yeah, yeah, says loves to grow, loves to grow. And what you're finding is that in this space of ambiguity, in this space of change, this person keeps falling back on what they know and it's not helping and it's actually keeping them stuck. And so I think there's the 
environmental level, and then there's the individual level. And in this world where things are constantly evolving, stagnancy isn't going to help anybody. You don't innovate. You can't have diverse, equitable, inclusive environments of belonging if people are going to stay in their comfort zone. I totally agree. And I think what can sometimes be hard about pushing yourself into that zone is it can feel really bad when you're in it, right? It's so uncomfortable. Who wakes up and is like, oh, I really hope I feel uncomfortable today. That's tough. And as you were talking, it makes me think about our times living abroad. And those were the hardest times for me and for my family and the best times, the times of growth, the times of learning and like just amazing experiences that I don't know how you could have possibly replicated if we didn't just do it and like dive in and go and live in places where we didn't speak the language and we didn't fully understand the culture and we didn't know where we were going and we had to basically relearn how to live. And then you look back on it and you're like, wow, what a gift that grew me as a person and it grew me as a leader and, you know, in all the different ways I found after you push through and then looking in the rear view mirror, you're like, thank goodness I said yes. Yeah. We call that waiting in the messy middle. That messy middle is, it sucks. Like that messy middle is such a hard place to be. And there isn't a fast forward because if we don't, we don't learn how to process. We don't build resiliency. And I think it's in our human DNA to want to avoid that messy middle at all costs, but we're short circuiting what's also on the other side, right? We're short circuiting, like you can't appreciate the growth or the transformation or the high points if you haven't gone through the yuck. And I think the more that you go through it, the more you're able to tell yourself, I've been here before, right? Like I felt this feeling of discomfort. I've been in the messy middle before and I've made it through and it's always been worth it. And so I will find a way through it this time again, because what's at the other end is totally worth it. And I think that's something that those that take risks, like you get a little bit of that, like high at the end where you're like, this is amazing. Like it was hard and I was unsure. And there were a couple of setbacks along the way, but when I got to the end, it was so worth it. And so I will take that risk again and again and again. Let's talk about then where you are currently. So you're at a really cool place, Bowery Farming, and you've been taking some of that attitude into, you know, helping to shape the culture and experience. So talk to me about some of the things you're doing there that really are crafting a fulfilling, unique human experience for everyone associated with Bowery Farming. In case anyone's not familiar with Bowery, Bowery is an indoor agriculture company. So we're leveraging science and technology to grow pesticide-free produce that uses fewer natural resources than traditional farming. And I feel so lucky to be working in this space. It's my first time working in a mission-driven company. And not to say that like companies they work for didn't have great cultures or amazing people. But I do think there's something different when you have the opportunity to work at an organization that has such a like deep purpose, like a company like Bowery, where the things that you're doing every day are in service of like greater service of the people on the planet. And then you bring together hundreds of people that have that same passion and you're just able to harness it in a different way. So I've never felt as energized, as committed as I have when I'm working at Bowery. And what's interesting, I, we're in a company that's trying to do something that's never been done before. And it's not just about like a little tweak or like disrupting something. It's about doing something that's really, truly never been done before and solving a problem that could change the world for the better. And sometimes people will say to me, but like you're in the people space. So like you could still do your work exactly the same way, right? Just because like the agricultural scientists and the operators are doing something totally brand new and different, people are people. And so you could bring the same culture or the same values or the same programs that you had at other places that you worked and bring them to Bowery. But I think that when you're in an environment that is so innovative and has people that are thinking wildly different, it's this invitation that you could do the same, right? Like you could build a different way of working. You could bring programs that are so culturally relevant and that really unlock what people are capable of in, in our environment. And so that's what I'm focused on, helping to bring the right experiences and program and light up the culture that is Bowery. And it's just it's been a blast. One of the first things that I did when I came to Bowery was work on the values. 
So I was here early enough to help with that work. Now, Bowery did already have some values when I came. And I always laugh when I tell the story. Bowery had 10 values when I came. And they were great. If you want your values to be cultural anchors, like 10 is just too many, in my opinion, to, to anchor to. I think it's really difficult to light up 10 things at the same time or, you know, have something that aligns in that way. So I went on a listening tour and really tried to deeply understand the culture at Bowery, what makes Bowery so special, and also how we saw Bowery in the future and what kind of company people wanted to work at. And so we ended up with four values that I think are so spot on and uniquely us. And then it's been so fun to try to weave those in, in both subtle and obvious ways. And I think that's what you do with your values to really make them the cornerstones of your culture is as a people team, anytime we're designing anything, we're relating it back to our values, thinking about how we're embedding them. So whether it's an event or a program, an experience, or people we're hiring and just making sure that people understand our values, align to the values and want to work in that way. We say sometimes, or I say anyway, you know, we have so much diversity at Bowery. It's truly the most diverse place that I've ever worked. And I think that happens when you're building something brand new. But where we don't have diversity is around our values. Like we have diversity of thought, perspective, communication styles, experiences, and all the different representations of diversity from an affinity perspective. But our values, we all believe in and we all live them. And if that's not the way you want to work or something that doesn't work for you, then Bowery isn't going to be the right place. But if when you see our values and hear our values and you are like, yes, like that's what I've been looking for. That's the way I want to work. Then this is going to be a place that that you're going to hopefully thrive and really enjoy. There's so much wisdom and value in that, no pun intended, <laughs> but I, I love how you talk about values as your cultural anchors, because so often they are just words on a website or words on a wall. And when people say, oh, cultural fit, that can end up with a homogeneous environment, but not true, right? It's about cultural fit. If you truly have a clarity of purpose and you've operationalized your core values to the point that they're not just words, but they're actually concrete behaviors that everybody can use as a filter. So every day when I show up, am I doing boom, boom, boom? When I approach a customer, when I approach an issue, when I'm trying to brainstorm, boom, 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 we come back to our values and say, okay, oops, we have to tweak this because we were out of alignment here. And it brings us back to our core. It brings us back to our center. And I think if you don't have those guideposts and you don't hold people accountable, you're not going to get very far and you end up with, you know, what people call purpose washing or they're like, oh, it's smoke and mirrors. So I love that you have what I would call deliberate practices around keeping them alive. And one of the things that I was smiling about as you were sharing, like, oh, you went and did listening tours that we tell people all the time is make one of your deliberate practices in your department meetings. Take a few minutes and have a round of storytelling. Who has a recent example? of either our purpose or our values in action. And what's the impact that had on you? Because your values, like you said, they exist. You elicited them through storytelling. And we call it a lighthouse, your purpose and values, but the storytelling keeps that lighthouse illuminated. But can you talk about what are some of these other concrete examples of how you really ensure that your values are not just some nice exercise you went through, but they really are embedded? Like, what are some of the things that you do that people can learn from? At a high level, it's the basics, right? Are you hiring for people that exhibit these values and want to work in that way? Are you recognizing and rewarding the things that people do and so on? But like how you actually operationalize that. For us, one of the cool things that we've done around our values is we actually have a podcast. And so there's a lot of different reasons that we have the podcast, but one of them is in a way to bring our values to life so that people can actually understand what it feels like to work at Bowery, the kinds of people that work at Bowery, the kinds of things you'd be working on if you came to Bowery in a very real way that's different than like reading about it on a website or an employee testimonial, but instead getting to listen to a podcast that features people from across Bowery talking about the work that they're doing in real ways and lighting up our values intentionally. So we have four of them. As an example, one of them is thinking wildly different. And if you listen to our podcast, 
though it's not always explicitly said, you will hear stories about how people are thinking wildly different. And just the fact that we have a podcast, I would argue, is an example of thinking wildly different. Yeah, I would say that that by itself is different than most, yes. So. Than different than most. Most, you know, stick to the job descriptions and, and the website. And we've tried to, you know, light it up in a different way. Another example, so one of our values is being kind to the core. And we really have spent a lot of time of thinking about what does that mean? Is it generosity of time? Is it about making sure that people feel included in a sense of belonging? Is it helping people to be authentically themselves? And the truth is, it's all of that and more. It's way, way more than being nice. And so there's lots of things that we do on the people team in terms of developing programs and working alongside our folks to deliver those programs. But I think about like our DEI programs as an example of being kind to the core, because we do recognize that you need to be able, of course, to be authentically you, to feel comfortable, to have psychological safety and all these things. And one of the best ways that I think we can do that is by creating amazing ERGs. And I'm so proud of the ERGs at Bowery. I always feel like I can't take any credit for them. So should I talk about them? But I can't stop talking about them because they're amazing. And for those who don't know, ERG is employee resource groups. We call them employee-led resource groups at Bowery because for us, that's really important that we set up, we being like the people team and my team, set up some of the structure, but so much of how they've evolved and their charters and the way that they work is about the people at Bowery coming together and having a purpose and deciding how they want to run them. So there are some things that are similar and some things that are quite different in the way each of them run. They just do amazing things from bringing in incredible speakers to sponsoring panels that you go from laughing to crying as people share so deeply about who they are and build connection, different lunch connections, all sorts of different things. And then it just like when I talk to people about things that they love at Bowery, people talk about the ERGs and how that created best friends at work for them and allyship and safe spaces during really tough times. I mean, the last few years have been so difficult. I don't think I've talked to anyone who have been like, oh yeah, that was a breeze. And you have to create now at work, which wasn't years ago, was not the case, but now it is at work. People are looking for an opportunity to, to talk, to be themselves, to find connections, to find support. And our ERGs are such a great way that, that we bring that to life and that they really, I think, embody the value of kind to the core. And that happened intentionally with them, right? It wasn't like I delivered it to them, but the, the folks that are leading our ERGs and participate in our ERGs, they completely understand that this is so aligned to one of our values and is part of bringing that to life for our employees. What I've seen happen in some companies, well-intended, but their ERGs end up further enabling division and silos, right? Where they people stick with whatever group they identify with and there's not intentionality to intermix them. And it, there's some people don't feel like there's a spot for them to be an ally because I don't belong to that group. So I love that you're really taking the de-siloed ab approach and the allies are included. And again, when you go back to your values as your cultural anchor and you start to look at do we or don't we support XYZ program, XYZ group, initiative, project, customer, whatever, they become your filter of, well, it makes sense. It's so aligned with one of our values. It's a no brainer. Why wouldn't we do it? And it becomes easier to know what to say yes to, easier to know what boundaries to set and easier to know what to say no to, but it does take deliberate practice. Like it's if you have it, but if you're not using it consistently. So what are some of the other things that you have embedded in your day-to-day -day operations that really help your values truly be that filter and that cultural anchor? I think that if you set the values up correctly, some of this happens naturally, right? Because we are hiring people who want to live these values. And so just as you were talking about silos as an example, again, reflect on our ERGs, one of our values is breaking barriers together. And I think one of the things that sets our ERGs apart is that they meet also together to look for intersection programming times that they can come together and co-sponsor or support one another in different ways and be allies to each other. 
And I've never seen that before. And maybe that's happening in other companies to me. That's that's brand new and so incredible to see the different ERG leaders. So we bring them together. They also meet on their own. And that's amazing. And that happens from us talking about constantly, how are you breaking barriers together? How are you thinking wildly different? What are you doing to demonstrate being kind to the core? And how do you opt in? Opt in is our fourth, which is a very active value about seeing how can I help? How can I get involved? No job too big, no job too small. We have all sorts of ways to recognize when those things are happening. And I think that when when folks especially are new to an organization, they're looking to those around them to role model what's expected and how to thrive and how to build those connections and so on. And we do, we're a really Slack heavy company. We're Slack and meeting heavy. So there you go. If you're thinking about joining Bowery and you don't like Slack and you don't like meetings, like <laughs> run, 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 run. But if you love collaboration and you want to be in contact with people and be working collectively, like this is the place. But in Slack, it's amazing how you will see people responding with our values. So people are constantly using them as icons. People, when they're giving shout outs or shouting out, saying, thank you for opting in or so-and-so thought wildly different or these three people broke a barrier together. And so it reinforces, right? It, it's natural as part of our vernacular. It's part of what we recognize. It's what we're talking about when we get up and we're talking on all hands or when we're posting things in channels, it's in everything. And so I think you have to just, once you start weaving into everything at the beginning, it was how can we bring this to life? How can we light that up? In fact, we had OKRs you know, every quarter about how we were embedding the values. And then at some point it becomes natural and it also becomes something that goes well beyond the people team. I think a great example, our PMO organization, our program management organization recently put a process in place. And one of the things that they were really looking at is how they help solve cross-functional collaboration to make it faster, smoother, getting the right people in the room, making the right decisions. And for us, that is about breaking barriers together. And they were looking at their lens. They absolutely understood that success at Bowery does not come through individual contributions. It comes through bringing the collective together. And that's magic. When you get a bunch of people with different experiences, different perspectives, working towards a common goal together in a room, that for us is magic. And that's breaking barriers together. And they were designing their programs around that to make sure that we could do that. And to me, that's where it's at, right? It's not about just the programs that I'm delivering or the experiences that my team is designing, but rather the fact that our values are such a part of who we are and they're so embedded in the culture that when different functions are designing their processes, their programs, that they're thinking about how are they embedding them as well. You bring up a good point because it's now like just so embedded in who you are, but I know we have one of our clients that they they tweaked their values to make them a better filter because they had too many lenses to look through and it was confusing, right? So they've kind of refined and and really, I think what they have is great. And now they're at that point of that their leaders are struggling with, how do we activate this or how do we operationalize it? And I've said, start out with storytelling, start out with, if you're, you have a team member who's struggling or frustrated, they only have four, we'll come back to that and go, was there a breakdown in one of these? And can you use that to have that guidance or coaching or feedback conversation. Some people think it's like, it's not an extra initiative that's coming from HR, or the people department or whatever, you know, whatever you call that. It's really as a leader, how do I embody this? How do I model this? I'm not going to be perfect. But then when we lose our way, if we lose our way, we use that to get us back in alignment. So I think that's a good segue because, you know, you talked about your own journey of getting out of your comfort zone and having that be part of the culture also at Bowery, but having these anchors to help make it safe and guide people. And I know one of the things that differentiates you is you do look at growth in a profound and intentional way. And I think I've been seeing a huge increase in inquiries about recognizing, gosh, our leaders aren't really equipped to lead in this environment, or we need, you know, you look at the reskilling and upskilling, all the people that are out there doing the research that is needed. And there's almost like this reactive of we need to do it, but we don't really want to invest or we're going to here do a one and done class or put something through our LMS. But really learning and development takes a different level of intentionality. So can you talk about how you view investing in employee growth and what are some of the things that you do to really bring that to life at Bowery? 
This is one of my favorite topics. So yes, definitely. And I'm, I'm really lucky that I work at a company and with leaders that believe wholeheartedly that learning and development is a differentiator, that we can bring the best people to Bowery. And part of what they're going to get at Bowery is they're working on like massively important work and they're going to grow and develop just by doing the day-to-day, but that is only part of it, that we also need to be investing back in people so that they can be ready for a future role, for a leadership role, taking on different and new experiences if that's the path that they choose. And so it's kind of, of course, you're going to automatically develop by doing these really cool stretch types of things and thinking differently. But we do actually have to provide programmatic types of solutions as well. And so from the very start, we've gone big on learning and development programs. For us, what we do is once a year, we do a needs analysis where we invite people to tell us the things that they like to develop in and what they think that they need. And then we look for similarities across cohorts. So every employee answers the survey if they'd like to, if they opt in and they want to share, talking about their biggest development needs and where they love to learn and grow. And then every manager also takes a survey thinking about their team and reflecting on where they see their team and where they would benefit from some growth and development as well. And then we look for similarities and we've been so lucky or that's the way it always works. There have been very clear trends and cohorts that we're then able to say, okay, we can solve this problem for big groups of people that have similarities. So for example, one cohort might be our managers, a cohort might be senior leaders, a cohort may be our more junior employees that are in individual contributor roles. And then of course, we also look at things that we can deliver across Bowery and on an annual basis, we're designing programs. And one of the things that I think is important in my team because of the pace at which we're working is sometimes we pick something and we don't know how we're going to solve it, right? So we'll communicate, we are going to go big on project management. And we're like, we don't know how, but we're definitely going big on it, you know? And so we make some commitments about what people can expect. And then we start designing the programs and laying out a calendar to to get that done over the course of the year. And so if you're a manager, you might be taking manager training, plus you might be working on project management, plus you might be part of a senior leader program that might be very much around personal and professional development and be a bit more individualized this year. And then next year, you know, it might be a different set of offerings for you, but we get such amazing feedback and like it absolutely makes my day when people will say, I can't believe at our stage we do all this, or I can't believe there's all of these things available for us. It's super, super cool. It makes me really excited. And I think people get a ton out of it and it's accelerating development. The other piece that's been really neat this year for the first time is in previous years, we focused a bit more on external partnerships, you know, bringing in experts because we're small and scrappy and we didn't have enough time to develop all the programs ourselves. But now we have such an amazing group of people at Bowery who have such varied skills and lots that they can share. Some of our programs, we've actually leveraged internal folks who opted in, who had an excitement around a certain skill and are willing to share. And those for me have been like, the absolute best. I'm learning and relearning things that I haven't thought about in a long time. And they're just, they're doing a fabulous job. So it's a combination of, you know, external investments and then stretching some people inside and asking people to to share their special talents as well. It's going really well for us. I, I love that we're able to focus that way on growth. We're not just growing plants, we're growing people. One of the things that struck me as you're describing your approach and It should be common sense, but let's be honest, a lot of companies are like, oh, we need people to learn this. And it's coming from a top down or a senior management perspective, or, oh, this is a trend. And you're not really asking the people. And I think not just with learning and development, so often organizations, again, they can be well-intended, but they end up offering services, resources, and programs to people rather than for and with them. And I love that rather than just, hey, we're going to do this every year and we're just going to keep adding more, you're really looking at, let's make it relevant. Is this what they need now? What does that look like? And the other thing I love that you're doing that I think so many organizations can learn from is, hey, you have amazing, talented people that want opportunities to share their gifts and talents. If we just define people by their job description or they fit in this box and we don't look at all the other ways that people can contribute their gifts and talents, serve the purpose and values of the organization, 
we're missing out. So I was speaking of taking risks and getting out of your comfort zone. I want to turn the tables on you for a little bit, because one of the things that I try to do in my work is normalize this messiness of being human. And the fact that no matter whether you're risk averse or risk taker, that we all get in our own ways. It's part of the human condition to want to self-protect, want to keep ourselves safe and small. So Carolyn, I would love if you would be willing to share what is a self-limiting story that you still tell yourself sometimes and when it shows up, how do you move beyond it so that you can still show up as a leader in your life and maximize your positive impact? I definitely, I do this. Um, I think I'm sure everyone does, but it resonates. I totally do it. I think it has changed over time. Like for me, I don't know that there's one single story, but it all relates back to my perspective doesn't matter because, right? So early on, it was that I was too young. I'm working with people who are 20 years more senior, 30 years more senior, and what perspective could I add? Or why would someone want to listen to my voice? And then sometimes it's all the years of being the only woman in the room, like, oh, you know, like, who's going to listen to me? I'm just me and they're them or whatever it is. And then you go to a new company and it's, I don't have the company knowledge, so I should just sit here until I learn more about the company or you change industry and you're like, I don't have the industry knowledge or whatever it is. But it's always that voice in your head that you're just not enough. And so the reason might change, but I think it's the same self-limiting narrative. I wish I didn't, but I do have it always. And I think that might be surprising actually, because I'm a pretty confident person, but like the things that go on in your head might be different than the things that, that come out and how to move beyond it. When I'm feeling insecure or unsure, I'm a bit of a planner. So if I can, I will think about the situation and what I want to say in that situation. So for example, if I think back or a lot of the times when it comes down to in my role, coaching someone and I'll think like, how am I qualified to coach this person? who's amazing, right? And then they've got either more of this or that than I do. And like, what am I going to bring to the table? And so I'll actually sit down and think about like, okay, what do I want them to to learn? What do I hope to share with them? And kind of outline some basics of the things that that I want to get across. And at the end, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have this. Why did I think I couldn't do this? I can do this. I do this all the time. And it, I think it just helps center me and remind me like I'm a person that if I can just take a couple minutes to prepare, then I'm like, oh, I've got this. And so a lot of times I'll tell others when they're doubting themselves, I'm like, just take a second, take a beat, prepare, and you'll be surprised. You can totally do this. Well, and I think taking that second, or I mean, preparation is your friend in a lot of things, but I also think taking that second to pause, what it does is it actually kind of short circuits that runaway narrative or story, right? And, and it allows like space for additional thinking to come in. I think that's what people don't realize sometimes, right? It kind of short circuits that autopilot, like, hey, hold on, that's one thought, pause, because maybe another thought will come in that will go, wait, you got this. Oh, I've done this a million times. But what happens is we're on autopilot and we just jump off of that self-limiting thought. And that's when it hijacks us, that's where we get in trouble. So I love, I love that. I love that you prep. I love that you, it's just great reminders, pausing and remind us of our past success. That can be helpful. (laughs) So... (laughs) All right. Are you ready for the quick questions? I think so. We'll see. (laughs) It's all good. Okay. All right. Fill in the blank. Living authentically is? Being part of being a leader. Yes. Yeah. How how can you be a leader if you're not going to be authentic? If you're not going to be authentically you. Yeah. All right. When the world is presenting an opening, but you don't feel like showing up as a leader, what do you do? Push through. Go for it. What is something people would be surprised to know about you? Well, I, it's so embarrassing, but I read a lot of trashy romance novels and I (laughs) I think, I think that, um, as embarrassing it is, I think that people are probably like, oh, she's probably like reading something so deep and meaningful right now. And it's like, no, it's like total trash. I love my total trash is I have a subscription to people magazine. There's my guilty. And I'm like, I'm like, I need my brain to shut off. I read everything else is cerebral. I need to just like check out. So I'm with you. I get you. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) What is your favorite go-to movie? Oh, that's so hard. I, I'm not like a person who watches the same movie over and over again. I'm more of a TV person. Like I watched the office 
way too much. So I like funny movies, but I'm, I have to, I'm like more of a TV person. Love it. So the office, there we go. We're, oh, I'm all about the office. Yes. Uh, Michael Scott. He, whew, anyway, <laughs> I've learned a lot from Michael Scott. <laughs> you learn what not to do. Not to do. Yes. What not to yes. do. Yes. And you know, what's so funny is that like the fact that there's shows like that, I mean, like it's cringy, but it's like, oh my gosh, there's like truth to it because there are, right. It's, it's, it's playing on the typical stereotypical. Anyway, it's just crazy. Oh, 100%. I mean, the DEI thing on your forehead, like that actually happened in companies. People did that. So yes. <laughs> and it's just there's, painful. There's some truth in it. It's so painful to watch. <laughs> okay. All right. What is your go-to song? It's definitely got to be Billy Joel. I love Billy Joel. We've gone and seen him so many times in Madison Square Garden. If I were going to pick one, I will pick Scenes from an Italian Restaurant. I love that song. Mm, nice. What is something you can't live without? Naps. Nice. <laughs> definitely naps. That was like, didn't have to blink an eye on that I know the answer to that one. It's naps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Besides naps, what is something in your ordinary daily life that makes your heart happy? My kids, they didn't come up in our discussion, but I'm a mom and they're the best. And they're still at that age when, like, when I walk in the door, they'll like run and give me a hug and like, oh, like, mom you know, and I know my days are probably numbered on that, oh, but it is. I miss those days versus like, eh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sometimes I look at my daughter and think, oh, you're probably going to hate me someday, but I love that you love me now. Oh, you know? and, and, live it up, live it up, love up this phase. Okay. And what are you grateful for right now? Oh, I mean, now and always my, my husband, he's the best. I'm so lucky to be married to my best friend. I don't think everybody can say that, but we have just so much fun together and yeah, it is true love. I am very lucky. That's awesome. All right. So one last closing question, Carolyn, if you could challenge leaders everywhere to practice this one behavior that would create more human workplaces and equip everyone to show up as a leader, what would that be? I think it's about more teaching. I think like we're so time starved and everyone's burnout, which I totally understand. I hear it. Sometimes I feel it myself, but if we can just take some more time to teach those around us, like I had such great teachers throughout my career, still do. And like it just makes a huge, huge difference. Like providing that context and coaching people and teaching them, it's worth it, right? It's worth the time investment to take the time. I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. To learn more, head over to peopleforwardnetwork.com and of course, hit that follow button.